Hello, I'm Senator Dick Durbin. Welcome to my Capitol Report, A Different View. I'm broadcasting this segment from one of the most iconic buildings in the world, certainly in the United States of America, the United States Capitol Building. It's a site which most Americans recognize instantly, and it's one that a lot of people like to come and visit. There are about 30,000 people who work in the Capitol Complex, which is about 10 connected buildings. And we literally have hundreds of thousands of visitors coming, some on official business, some as tourists, from all over the world every single day. It's quite a management job to make sure that the Capitol is working and to make sure the Senate side and the House side are communicating with one another. And there are a myriad of activities that go on here. Obviously, the business of government is number one, the work of the Senate, the work of the House of Representatives. But in addition to that, there's another effort underway to feed the tourists who arrive here, to make sure that they're safe, to make certain that everything is working in an orderly fashion, and to take this beautiful old historic structure and keep it functioning in the 21st century. One of the people with the responsibility for this Capitol building is the Sergeant Arms of the United States Senate, Terry Gaynor. Terry, I'm glad you're with us today, and I'm proud of the fact that you are also a fellow Illinois native. It's great to be here, and it's great to be an Illinoisan too, Senator. Thanks. Well, tell me a little bit about your family background in Illinois. Well, we're longtime Illinoisans. There actually has been a gain around the Chicago Police Department every year for the last 104 years. So besides my grandfather and uncles, my four brothers were there, and I have relatives uh, there. Now I have a son-in-law on the police department, and actually three of my nephews are on the Illinois State Police. So we're really a kin and part of Illinois, Chicago, and as you might remember, I spent 10 years living in Springfield uh, and raising some of my children there. So let's go back to the beginning, though. Are you a South Sider? Oh, for sure. Okay, and what parish would that be? That would be uh, St. Barnabas. St. Barnabas. I grew, I grew up in St. Margaret of Scotland and just moved one parish <laughs> over to St. Barnabas. <laughs> and where'd you go to school? I went to uh, St. Margaret of Scotland, and ironically enough, this Saturday is my 50th grade school reunion. Okay. I went to uh, Mendel Catholic High School out in Roseland, and then to Paul Law School for graduate school, and excuse me, DePaul University for graduate school and law school. And I went off to Atchison, Kansas, to St. Benedict's College for undergrad. And you were a member at one point of the police force in Chicago? I sure was. I did my first 20 years on the Chicago Police Department with timeouts uh, for the military. I was on active duty for a number of years, was spurred over in Vietnam. But after I returned, uh, I stayed on the Chicago Police Department. They were very good to me as uh, a lot of uh, VA benefits, as a matter of fact, that let me get my, my uh, uh, master's degree and my law degree. And then I was fortunate enough to be uh, asked to be the director of the Illinois State Police, where I did that for nearly 10 years. I remember that. And that was under Governor Edgar? It Is was. That right? Yes, it sure was. That must have been a special responsibility, not only the big city of Chicago, but little towns all around Illinois. Tell me what you remember from that experience. Well, it did give me a great perspective nationwide, or statewide, because I really was kind of a Chicago guy, a South Side guy, or West Side guy. And it was nice, A, when the family moved to Springfield, and uh, the kids there went to uh, Christ the King and Sacred Heart Griffin. But to move throughout the, the state was special. And then even a couple times uh, down south in uh, East St. Louis, one of our uh, trooper lieutenants went down there and took over that police department. So it was nice moving around the, the state and seeing uh, Illinois from a different perspective. Your next assignment after the Illinois State Police was an interesting one too. Where were you going to? Well, it was. I was asked to come out and be the number two, the executive assistant chief of the D.C. Police Department. I joined uh, Chief Ramsey in, in that capacity. Who was formerly with the Chicago Police uh, right. Department. Right. So we had, when I was the director, he was the number three of the Chicago Police Department. He was selected to be the chief of D.C. and asked me to come out and run operations. So that was a a four-year experience and actually I thought being a Chicagoan that maybe Washington would be a piece of cake and I, I had to learn a lot. And so after that assignment you came up to Capitol Hill, correct? It was and that was a great opportunity too because I really wanted to be a chief again and I didn't have to move. So becoming the chief of the Capitol Police, a stellar police department, it was needed growth after 9-11 and some of the other things. So it was a nice opportunity to stay right in the same city and take over leading an organization again. How many uh, men and women serve on the Capitol Police Force? Well, the total complement is about 2,500, which makes it one of the top 20 law enforcement uh, agencies in the nation. It's not all sworn. It's a, there's a substantial civilian 
portion of it, which does not only the administrative stuff, but they do a lot of things fire departments might do. So we have one of the largest hazardous material response units in the United States, comparable to many uh, fire departments. Canine um, and the uh, technology and the communication all run by civilians. It's a good partnership. So what did, what, how would you distinguish the Capitol Police from, say, the Washington, D.C. Police? What, what are the differences in terms of law enforcement between the two forces? Well, it's really changed dramatically, even, again, after 9-11 and some of the other attacks. Remember, we had ricin up here and anthrax. We've had two policemen killed in this building. So these officers, in addition to being guides, how do I get where, who can get in the building, but they're also really become anti-terrorist specialists. So they're new centurions of a different ilk. So they're not running down a lot of alleys after burglars, but they have to be prepared to greet people, get them to the right place, and then be on defense uh, against those who might want to take down this very symbolic place. What about the typical investigative responsibilities of a police department, uh, the detectives and so forth? Is there anything comparable with the Capitol Police? Well, there is a little bit because uh, any thefts that occur in this area, and as you pointed out, there's some 30,000 employees and 6 million visitors, so there is crime up here. And uh, they're responsible for the investigation of it. While we have joint jurisdiction with the Metropolitan Police Department, they leave this area to us, and it's done very, very well. So we have detectives working that, and the Dignitary Protection Division, much like the Secret Service, protects the leader of the House and Senate. So on the House side, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, is the next third in line for the presidency, and the uh, president of the Senate is the fourth in line for the presidency. So our agents and DPD agents are responsible for their protection. Tell me about the training facilities for the Capitol Police. We, uh, we took a camera out there and it's a pretty amazing operation. And they do go through a lot of training. Again, very similar to a state or city police department. They'll start out first at FLETC, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Georgia. They'll do six months there. Then they come up to the northern Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Cheltenham, and they'll go through some of the very typical things in classroom. Uh, we also, through the, what Congress has done, we've built mock chambers, uh, um, mini stairwells out there so they can learn to navigate that, but they have to go through a driver's uh, training, evasive driving training, because we have patrol responsibility and our dignitary protection. And then firearms. These people have to work in close quarters uh, to be uh, both uh, reactive and proactive on someone who might try to get in a gun battle up here. Your next assignment was Sergeant at Arms of the United States Senate. Uh, now, what number would you be? I'm the 38th Senate Sergeant of Arms, so there's actually been fewer of us than Presidents of the United States, so maybe the job is longer term. It, it sounds like it. Tell me about the special responsibilities of that office. Well, it is very unique because not only am I the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the Senate, but handling the protocol, and that's nice because you get to interact with heads of state or the President, so very much involved in the State of the Union and the inauguration. But the other part is really behind the scene, more like a city manager. So uh, our office, the nearly 1,000 career employees, handle the IT shop here and the 450 offices around the, the United States the post office, the telephone, the TV studios, the pages, the barber shop, the beauty shop, uh, the parking, the ID card. So it really is trying to help uh, the staffs uh, make it perfect so the members of Congress can do their job. And tell me, uh, as you've served as Sergeant Arms, how long have you been in service? I'm now? just coming up on five years now, so I'm in this, uh, my third term. The Senate, after the leadership, Senator Reid nominates me. The Senate votes on it for two-year terms, so I'm just uh, about finishing the first year of the third term. One of your more dazzling responsibilities to, is, is to escort the President of the United States into his joint sessions of Congress and State of the Union addresses, as well as heads of state. Tell us, if you can, a little bit about those experiences. Well, it, 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 it's pretty neat to tell you the truth. That You get up close and personal, and you see how they prepare and how they react and how the members uh, lead them in, as you do. But one of the interesting things about uh, one of the presidents was I told my grandkids, and I have 14, that Grandpa would send him a signal, and I pulled on my ear, ear a few times. Carol Burnett. And finally, the <laughs> president said, you know, uh, what, what's the matter? Why do you keep tugging on your ear? And I said it was a signal to the grandkids, and he said, you need a new signal. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was to just see the personal side of them is nice. Any interesting stories about foreign visitors, foreign heads of state? Well, one is I was walking through the, the hallways with uh, the Prime Minister of, uh, of England, 
and I was telling him about the mitten tiles on the floor. And as you know, the Senate takes great pride in preserving our building the way it is. Well, I'm trying to talk a little bit about the mitten tiles, and he knew the owner of the place and the grandfather, so it was really almost stump the chump. He knew more about the, what was going on around here than I did. What have you seen by way of changes in the way the Capitol has operated in the time that you've been here? Well, it's become very, very serious about the threats. Most, as you know, Flight 93 was destined for here, and we still have a lot of intelligence that I think that our adversaries would like to strike here in some way. So there's been a dramatic buildup in the police department, and you'll see heavier weapons and more difficult to get in the building. But that having been said, the building is always open. The people's business is be being done. So things like the uh, earthquake that happened uh, just a short time back, we were able to adapt very quickly and move people around and even have a session outside the building for the first time in 200 years. Now, that was an interesting thing. I think Senator Coons came down from Delaware. Yes. It was during our August recess. It was one of those very brief sessions. But they actually went to another building outside the Capitol for a session of the Senate. Exactly. Is that the first time that ever happened? It is. It's the first time in 200 years. So we rehearse for a lot of different things that could happen, attacks, fires, anthrax, rice, and some of the, 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 the worst case scenarios. We hadn't actually talked about an earthquake. That was new to us. But the preparation and carrying it off was uh, done by a lot of great professionals, both on my staff and the Secretary of the Senate. And the Senator was very adaptable. So we had to make sure the, the building was open, the press could be part of it, because that's important, uh, that our television uh, cameras were up and running, and that uh, we had the, uh, the gavel that would open the session. That's great. Terry Gaynor, Senate Sergeant at Arms, Southsider from Chicago, thanks for your service. Thank you, And Senator. your friendship. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you for joining us for this Capitol Report, A Different View. It's an inside look uh, in Washington at our United States Capitol, some of the historic events that have made this city famous, and also some of the people from Illinois who are a big part of the congressional family. Terry Gaynor, I want to thank him again for coming to us uh, originally from the south side of Chicago, being such an important part of the United States Senate. Next month, we're going to have another segment. I hope you'll join us. I'm looking forward to it, and thank you for being with us this time.